Hi there. Most likely this year, you will have spoken to family, friends and colleagues remotely via the internet. That is how we've been able to make this podcast. Therefore, it's very likely that you've experienced those amazing audio special effects like compression, lag, and my personal favourite, sounding like a robot. So don't you worry, we've worked very hard and managed to achieve those exact same special effects on this podcast at times, so that we remain on brand with most people's 2020. I hope you enjoy the show. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas. This is the Lockdown Hotline Sessions with your host, Danielle Lonnan. Oh, we're sorry, we answer that. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Lockdown Hotline Sessions with me, your host, Danielle Lonnan. This is the podcast where we put identical questions to all of our guests, but they mix it up, spice it up, and entertain us with their unique take on COVID and lockdown in 2020. Today's guest are husband and wife duo, Gregory and Abigail Moppen. Gregory Moppen is an actor, text coach, dramaturg with Kentucky Shakespeare. He's a chartered member of Brooklyn's Under the Table Ensemble. Kentucky Shakespeare appearances include Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, Guildenstern, As You Like It, Touchstone, Twelfth Night, Malvolio, Midsummer, Bottom, Macbeth, Porter, with the Actors Theatre Louisville, Lunagale, Cliff, at the Vanishing Point, Martin, Our Town, Simon Stimson, Midsummer, Flute, Macbeth, 43 plays for 43 presidents, with the Delarte Company, Vaudeville, co-creator. Gregory graduated from the Delarte International School of Physical Theatre. Abigail Bailey Moppen works regularly with the Kentucky Shakespeare, where she's taken on wide swath of roles, including Lady Macbeth, Beatrice, Kate, Olivia, Gertrude and Jacques, among others. She started playing make-believe professionally at the age of seven, received a BFA in musical theatre with a concentration in directing from the Boston Conservatory and paid lots of dues during her 11 years in New York City. Her regional and New York credits include Sweeney Todd at the Goodspeed Opera House, Babes and Dudes, Die Like a Lady, New York International Fringe Festival, Iolanthe, Village Light Opera Group, New York City, Gift of the Magi, Vermont Stage Company, Hansel and Gretel, Theatre Works slash USA. In Louisville, she has appeared with the Actors Theatre, MTL slash Stage One, Derby Dinner Playhouse, Theatre 502, and Savage Rose. Together, they are the ukulele duo Ranigazoo, frequently appearing live on Radio Kentucky's Homefront and Kentucky USA, as well as their own streams and performances. They also wrote The Glorious Adventures of the Mighty Robin Hood, and in 2004, they co-founded Le Betomain Theatre Ensemble. Some of Abigail's favourites include the title role in Moliere's Don Juan, and a country music singing Emily Dickinson. Some of Gregory's favourites are Oberon and Benjamin Franklin Stein. They were also the Pirate King and Mabel in Abigail's father's favourite Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, The Pirates of Penzance, at the Iroquois Amphitheatre. With Kentucky Shakespeare, they have been Kate and Petruchio, Beatrice and Benedict, Launce and Speed, and have had the great honour of travelling to Stratford-upon-Avon with a small contingent from the company to perform at the Shakespeare Birthplace and on the BBC for the 400th anniversary celebration in 2016. They currently narrate audiobooks for the National Library Service at the American Printing House for the Blind. Abigail and Gregory, hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you both today? All right, pretty well, actually. Not, Not bad, not bad today. (laughs) <laughs> it's one of the good days. <laughs> yeah, yesterday was not great. Oh, I see. But today's better. Yes, it is. Definitely. Uh, okay, cool. Well, as you know, we ask identical questions to all of our guests, but we have an exclusive world first here. We have a duo on the podcast. So from all <laughs> of our theatre experience, this podcast could be the best game of theatre sports we have ever played. <laughs> 
And for those of you who have never played theatre sports, the general rule is that you don't block your fellow performers. So, are you ready to start? No. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much, Gregory. That is an excellent masterclass lesson in how to block a performance. Wow. You can always rely on him. That was for educational purposes. Yeah, that's that all it was for. I wouldn't have really done it had it not been for educational purposes. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I always hear the word no in a context like this, and I hear it. There's a voice of a fellow I did improv with many, many years ago saying no. No, on stage because someone, someone entirely blocked him on stage, and the other guy responded to him with this thinly veiled grin of like, "Did you in fact just say the word no?" In, in a very, uh, I won't say threatening way, but it was hell was to be paid later. <laughs> well, now that we've moved past the educational part of the uh, podcast. For those who want to learn improvisation and comedy, I will go back and re-say the last lines and we will go with a positive response so that we can oh, continue oh, the yeah, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, a positive response from Greg? Or well, in, yeah, both. Uh, I think both. Both. Yeah, oh. yes, yeah. Well, Sorry. from both. Well, you already gave me a positive response, <laughs> guys, so most probably Greg. So if I was a stage manager, I'd take myself back, cue my lines and go, go. Okay. So, for those who have never played theatre sports, the general rule is that you do not block your fellow performers. Are you both ready to start? Yes. Yes, we are. Yes. All right. (laughs) Round of applause. Excellent work, Tim. Excellent work. Okay. I had to keep my eye on him that time. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for keeping him in line. That was excellent (laughs) assistant stage managing working there. Very impressed. Very impressed. Okay, so question number one. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourselves that perhaps wasn't covered in the introduction? You start. I'll start. I was born and raised uh, here where we are now in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, uh, so I've flittered about uh, here and there over the years. Uh, We came back here and settled a few years ago to start a theater company of our own, uh, uh, which was, I don't know, very exciting. Uh, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was, it was for, for a good solid 10 years. And uh, we've got, that was all in the bio, though. Uh, but um, is there anything else exciting about me? No, I, I am incapable of meeting a musical instrument that I don't want to pick up and figure out, although I am perfectly aware and have for many years been aware that that doesn't count and doesn't make one a player of that instrument, merely an owner. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that happens a lot. I've chilled on that now. Financially, I can. It's is great. Um, it, it, it's much more, much more useful, really. In the long run. What, what else would you say about me, Abigail? That is more interesting. Uh... Uh, yes. <laughs> I so know. clearly, I keep her. I think we've been uh, married too long. Uh, now. I know right. all your stuff, and I, <laughs> I don't know what other people don't. Uh, wow. uh, I, I appreciate Beaujolais. I, uh, uh, I don't know. I, uh, I, I make. I'm the cocktail maker here at home, so mm. she's the orderer. I read a lot of books. There, done. That's me. <laughs> That's me all over. All right. I was born in New Jersey, which I don't tell a lot of people. Luckily, we moved away from there when I was very small, and I grew up in New England, up in New Hampshire, uh, and so, which was very idyllic and, you know, snowy winters and beautiful falls and all of that sort of thing. And uh, I escaped from there uh, and spent 11 years in New York City, which was also not my thing, before we met and got married and moved down here. And Louisville's kind of a happy medium. I I really like Louisville. It's not a small town, nor is it an overwhelming city. It's it's a happy medium. But I know what's fun about, interesting about us. What? Yeah. It's how we met. Oh, yes, that is true. The the story that people seem to like. um, We met at a luau in Boston when I was living in New York and he was living in Chicago. Yes. So I, it was meant to be. <laughs> we, uh, we were going to two separate weddings on the same weekend in Boston and we ended up staying at the same friend's apartment. And no. she, had never thought to, she had never thought to introduce us before and decided since we were both going to be there that the, the day after the wedding, she was going to have a luau. And we just started talking and 
pretty much haven't stopped. Not then, no. Oh my god, that's so lovely. <laughs> that's really cute. <laughs> it is kind of cute. Oh, you'll appreciate also that a significant part of the evening post luau was spent watching the third series, a uh, couple of episodes of the third series of Black Adder. <gasps> Well, yes, I approve of that very I much. Said. I think it was Amy and amiability. Do, mm-hmm. do you remember mm-hmm. that right? Anyway, yeah. Miranda Richardson? Yeah. Not important, but just a little detail we thought. <laughs> and when you meet somebody and right away they're okay with watching Blackadder with you, Again. you know it's meant to be. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, Pirates of Penzance. Uh, that was also the weekend. Um uh, so I gave her, a, I was going to visit some friends in New York uh, for the week following. So I had a rental car. And so she had taken the bus into New York. And I said, yeah. I swear I'm not a hatchet murderer. Would you like to come with me back to New York in the car instead of sitting on a bus for several hours? And she foolishly, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, agreed to the car ride. And when a man travels alone back in those days of having just a CD player in the car, he does not bring impressive music, you know, like, hey, I hear some cool things that I'm into. He brings things that he was intending to listen to by himself. So I had, I don't even remember what all I had. I know there was some Frank Zappa in there, which is like the last, you don't, that's not a thing that you put, but anyway. Impress a girl. No, 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 you don't. You don't put like weird, like sort of loud jazz, which I had some as well, of the sort that is like no one wants to listen to but me. But I did have a recently acquired 1929 doily cart recording of some 78 uh, uh, that obviously on CD you know, that were uh, of, of highlights from the Pirates of Penzance, which we proceeded to listen to in its entirety more than once singing all of the parts. <laughs> <laughs> I am now that I am 47, I am officially old enough to play roof. As <laughs> I, should. I have the range. I just didn't have the years. Route. And Abigail, I'm sure you'd be up for uh, the pirate King. <laughs> oh, I'm ready. Yes. Although she's more of a Frederick. Vocal range, yes. Vocal range, yes. Oh, okay. but, uh, but I'm ready to yeah. be the pirate king. Yes, you are. In my soul. Sass wise, absolutely the pirate king. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Klein, watch out. Right? Yeah, exactly. I'm going to move on to question number two, So, which I think you may have just answered, but can you tell us okay. w- what your current location is and what the state of lockdown is there? Mm-hmm. Well, we are still in our house in Louisville, uh, yes. where we've in been the, this whole time. In the corner of the upstairs spare room where I have set up a couple of foamy sound tiles and uh, and a couple of microphones because mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll get around to that later, but there's been a lot of time that the two of us have spent with microphones in front of our faces here at home because we have to do something. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, in Kentucky. Uh, in lockdown here. I- we're not really in lockdown. I feel like that was only a few weeks in the spring that they really said, we're closing the state down, everybody stay home. And then they started to reopen things and there's been recommendations to stay home as much as you can, but it's not official. You don't get in trouble if you don't do it. So restaurants are, or interior restaurants, I should say, are closed right now. I guess for the rest of this weekend until they were checking some numbers. Numbers are currently have been steadily decreasing for the last week, okay. which is good. Yep. Uh, which means people were better at Thanksgiving than we thought they were. But it had gotten very high. It had, it had gotten very high. And, and that seems to be holding. And we know that there are 11 hospitals in the state that are supposed to receive mm. vaccines within, within the, the next week, I think, and start giving them to the frontline medical workers uh, uh, first. So, and some hospital pool. I yeah. Mean, you know, patients. That's the word. <laughs> uh, so that, that's where we seem to be. Okay. And one question that I've been following up with, are masks mandatory where you are? Uh, Face masks. You mean if you want to talk to us or if you just want to walk the streets? For us, <laughs> if you want to get anywhere near us, yes. As far as the state laws are concerned, no. There is a strange, the, the governor uh, of Kentucky who has been, who has made very valiant attempts throughout all this, uh, but we have a Democratic governor with a Republican legislature in the state of Kentucky. Okay. And yep. so he is he's fighting he, an uphill battle. Without saying it out loud, he's essentially a hamstrung, unable to actively make it because he has a an attorney general who is a, a McConnell protege. And I, I don't want to talk about all that often. <laughs> but it would be difficult for him 
to make a mandate stick. So he has gone to great lengths to do everything, to use every word but mandate, every polite seeming word that does not have an actual legal repercussion behind it. Recommendation. Uh, uh, His talk to us every afternoon uh, uh, via computers and internet and whatnot, he's very much everybody's disappointed father. Yes, that is the tone. Uh, and early on, he said, y'all can't be doing that. And that turned into a, a T-shirt and all sorts <laughs> of people used it as a, you know, Andy says, y'all yeah, can't be doing that. We can't be doing that. Wow. Okay. It, it's been really interesting to talk to everyone around the world and see mm. who has to wear masks, who doesn't have to wear masks, and what the government regulations are for that particular area of the world. So yeah. It's frustrating here. I, right. I have to say, I'm, I'm very frustrated with yeah. it. Yeah. I think I think everyone's really frustrated with it, but uh, it, it sounds that you might be a little bit more frustrated than uh, <laughs> the rest of us. So I'm going to move on to question number three. All right. All right, here we go. So are you still in the same location as pre-COVID, as in early March? And are you still doing the same thing? And when I mean are you still doing the same thing, if you worked in a pub, in March, are you still working in a pub now in December? Uh, well, we, are, we are not. <laughs> we are not. We are in the same place. Uh, I mean, our home is still our home, and we've been in it all the time. But you, you're uh, still in we, Louisville, Kentucky. You, you know, we're you still in Louisville, yeah. Kentucky. Yeah. yeah, okay. No. And, but, uh, and we do still have, uh, uh, though it has changed a bit, but we are still reading our audiobooks at, uh, for the National Library Service uh, at the American Printing House for the Blind. That is, that's, that's then cut back yes. a, a bit. We are not, you know, our jobs as actors and performers. Uh, we were supposed to have our regular summer season at Kentucky Shakespeare, and that didn't happen. No. Um, you know, our our regular musical gig work that's all gone. So, you know, certainly financially and and performing wise, we are not at all in the same place. No. As, as beforehand. So it's been a worldwide phenomenon speaking to all of these people who work in any kind of industry where there is mass gathering of people. And it doesn't have to necessarily be the arts. It could be travel. It could be hospitality. You know, anytime there's more than 10 people, everything just seems to get cancelled very, very quickly. So that that's a real shame. That is a, a real shame to hear that. But I guess, you know, these are the signs of the time, right? I, yeah. I think one of the, the big frustrations is that feeling of if if we had all been more um, careful and dedicated to the lockdown at the beginning, you know, we mm -hmm. wouldn't be where we are right now. Yeah, right. And that's a, a frustrating feeling. Frustrating. That's my big word for this. I'm very <laughs> frustrated. I know, but the gift of hindsight <laughs> is always amazing after the mm -hmm. fact, right? Yeah. 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 It's yeah. 2020. So. <laughs> so since COVID-19 and the restrictions started, what do you miss doing that you can't do right now? Traveling. Yeah, traveling yeah. is large. <laughs> we, we, we aren't people who travel constantly, and we had, we had decided to remedy that. With the last December, we were having conversations about this year is going to be us. We're going to actually go to those places. You know, we, as actors, it is difficult to buy a concert ticket, much less a plane ticket, because you never know when the gig is going to arrive. And like, well, I can't go and see anyone on, on Thursday night at the at the theater who's coming to town because I will be doing show a show or rehearsing. Yeah. So we were like, all right, we know when we are and are not working. We're going to risk it. We're going to go to X or Y or visit a friend and see. And we, uh, <laughs> I, I guess it's obvious that we did not do any of that, but, but that was, we were looking forward to that. <laughs> We've been doing live streams uh, of our of our, <laughs> really our musical uh, foolishness and this i guess folds in with acting performing in general but that something about that performing on a little screen versus performing in a room full of people that you are intentionally sharing air with and light with and such it, it, yeah. it really is and it is inexplicable how i you know neither of us has ever really done in significantly any film that is not yeah. a thing that we do. Okay. And uh, we are stage folk. Yeah. We, we are, are trunk live people. performance people. And that really is a shift. Like all of my, it's not just the sort of, oh, the magic and the spirit. It's like the, I, 
the way my personal skill set works, that's how I know how to operate. I know how long to hold, you know. I, I don't know how to do that with just the phone looking at Right, me. but there's no audience response happening. I find that really interesting because I was teaching music via Zoom and that's a terrible way to teach music because <laughs> you can only have one audio source at the time. But a couple of Sundays ago, I played my first music gig with people uh, and you just forget mm. Being able to yeah. perform with people, reading each other, going, okay, you're going to take that solo. I need to do something yeah. here. And, you know, it's a subconscious collective, but it's like, right. oh, wow. So, Abigail, what do you feel that you've missed during this uh, time? I was just thinking, and, and and I got some videos this morning from a friend. I miss seeing the little kids that we know. Yeah. Um, Greg and I don't have any kids of our own, but we are the, the auntiest and uncliest people in the world and we have <laughs> actual nieces and nephews, but we also just love the kids of our friends. And I, I really am missing out watching, especially the little ones who, who grow so fast that yeah. suddenly it's been so many months and, and I get videos from our friends. I'm like, when, when did she turn, right. you know, four, but right. it seems like she's last time we saw her, she seemed like such a baby. And now she's talking and putting Legos together and, and I miss being able to kind of go play with them and talk to them and, and see some of that. Yeah. We're like rental kids. <laughs> <laughs> we're avuncular and what, what was the word? Martyrtoral by choice, not by, you know, with, oh, oh, kids yeah. are great. We don't want one in the house. But, but we really enjoy, you know, winding up someone else. Yes. And, uh, I, and, and <laughs> well, and that's part of the fun. This is also like interacting with them, not just watching them, but there is that the interacting with kids yeah. is, such a hoot yeah. and this is watching them do something weird is delightful on a little video but being being right. there to make them do something to, to talk them into doing something even weirder to their parents <laughs> consternation <laughs> training them to do those odd little words that like what is what where did they get that yes. <laughs> so what skills do you feel that you have both improved at during this time i know what i've improved at sewing wow i i yeah, I started making masks early on and, you know, going on YouTube tutorials for like, how do you make a mask? And I made some of the accordion ones first and those were terrible and difficult. And then I found this really great tutorial for a little round one. And yeah, so someday our kitchen table will be a kitchen table again. But right now it's got my sewing machine and all of this material and thread and stuff. And I'm like, I can sit down and whip one of these out pretty quick. and they're getting better. And I just figured out a way to improve them. And I feel like, oh, this I have gotten better at this. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. I feel pretty proud. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah I, I would. That's, that's really impressive. <laughs> I have to think of something. But you know what, I, Abigail, I hope you will hold me uh -huh. up on this. I feel like as the cocktail maker here in the house, I feel mm -hmm. like my cheeky drink skills have gotten more focused yeah. because they're a particular Ooh. skill set, you know, yeah. and that has been your that, adventures mm -hmm. with Falernum? Yes, have, yes, yeah. have, have paid off for mm -hmm. <laughs> um, But unfortunately, I feel like most of the things I've done otherwise, not unfortunately, it's been fine, uh, have been things I already used to do. I have right. found weirdly that I have been able to focus. <laughs> that can really focus on escapism. Does that make sense? <laughs> Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> is that not self-contradictory? And even if it is, uh, uh, but but I have been I have read like a mad person, and I've always been a reader. But I have just sort of finish one, throw it over my shoulder, grab another one off the shelf, and that has been uh, as someone who who likes to write, as someone who likes to narrate, uh, uh, like we enjoy these things. I feel like that's been it's actively been a sort of educational process. I've read a lot of yeah stuff that, that I feel like it's stuck with me perhaps more than it has in previous years of just reading for vague entertainment. And that's been nice, that sort of little vague dilettante-ish self-education. Yeah. I like to call it the uh, pub trivia knowledge bank. You never know when it's going to come in handy. Yeah. <laughs> I have a pear-shaped well-roundedness. <laughs> You know what I think you've gotten better at? What? All of this technical stuff. You know, as, as we've been doing our little Rainy Gazoo Facebook live concerts and we've been recording our own stuff for fun and, and just 
doing Zoom meetings with people of play readings and whatever, I, I think you've really figured out a lot more than you used to know about. So that's probably true. That's what plug goes but, where and yeah. how to balance sound things. And yeah, the the technical part of making any uh, product at the moment is is quite it challenging. Is. You go, oh, yeah, you just stick a camera and a, a microphone in and it'd be fine. It's like, <laughs> no, no, there's actually there's a little bit of it, art it that is. goes to it. There's a lot of skill and yeah. a little bit of art. Mastering is the part I need to, well, mastering. That's, <laughs> that's my trick because I don't fully understand. Like, all right, I recorded it. Now, how how me make sound good? <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, we haven't, until such time as, as something we're doing is bringing in enough uh, financial return so that I can turn this room into a sound studio, then uh, then yep. we'll see. But for the moment, they're going to have to. People are going to have to be satisfied. It's funny we did. We've been doing some uh, spoken word recording. Yeah. Uh, for our uh, for our Patreon, and I wrote a little bumper, a little uh, disclaimer, sort of at the beginning that says more or less, "Hi, do you hear that? It's a lawnmower." Uh, it's a dog, it's an airplane. Uh, we're going to record these and we would like you to think of this as your friend there in the room reading something to you, not someone in an antiseptic studio because you're not going to hear an antiseptic studio. <laughs> you're going to probably hear the dog. Yes, and if I stop every time there's a dog, then I'm going to be doing this for days. So let's just enjoy, enjoy the rough edges. <laughs> so that's my, my work goes towards changing the aesthetic instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of mastering the technology. I put a very similar disclaimer at the front saying that, you know, this is an internet phone call. There is a chance that this could drop out or we could also have robots. But, you know, let's keep on theme with 2020. (laughs) Right. On the flip side, what have you possibly discovered that you are absolutely rubbish at? Oh, there's so much to choose from. Uh, (laughs) You just answered that you feel like you've, you know, the same stuff that you've always been good at, mm, you are still good at. mm. I feel like I have just made more concrete the stuff that I'm bad at. Uh, <laughs> I am not good at learning music by ear, which you would think being half of a musical duo, I would need. And I yeah. I am not good wow. at that. Yeah, really? Greg Greg always has to write out the music for me. I can read music. So she can read hand music. me a music yeah. and I'm good. She can read music the way other normal people read paragraphs. Like I don't have to play the things on an instrument. She can just sort of go, Oh, okay, that. Okay, is, okay. Uh, which I find ear is so difficult. <laughs> yeah, wow. I mean, I can tell oh, both. I can play by ear and by music. That's strange, right? <laughs> which has made me get better at that. Other at, at, at writing out the music, it, yeah. which I'm not normally good at. I'm, I'm usually more a sort of throw it in the air, and we'll figure it out if we both catch it. Yeah. You have a great ear. You can pick out harmonies for things. Yeah. You mean fake? Yes, <laughs> I can fake harmonies. For things. I can't do them the same way twice. It's the hard part. <laughs> But, you know, I, I think it's kind of like going back to that audio mixing and everything like that. You can't start out being like George Martin, the right. Beatles producer, and producing these amazing things, or, or like Leonardo <laughs> da Vinci and painting the Sistine Chapel. You've got to start with stick figures. And the biggest thing I've learned is that you need to make mistakes. You need to yeah. do it to make mistakes, to <laughs> learn. Are you ready, Abigail? Uh-oh. George Martin produced the Beatles, and Leonardo da Vinci couldn't even manage to produce wings. <laughs> This is when the wedding ring comes off. <laughs> this is when I start to struggle to get the thing off. Uh, some Vaseline, possibly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Should I go slam the door? Go slam the door, right. <laughs> Do the loud footsteps and then the slam of the door, the Stan Freeberg Foley, yes. Me outside the door saying, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. I'm, hurt. Hurt. <laughs> I'm leaving, I'm going to mother. <laughs> <laughs> what if I become rubbish now? Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. You know, I really, it's funny, my ability to focus on these not necessary uh, readings that I've been doing. My ability to manage time mm. again, which was always pretty poor, okay. has gotten even worse. My ability to have a sense, and it's difficult to manage time when I'm sitting, you know, staring at the wall, as we all have done for the last few months, <laughs> pondering its meaninglessness. <laughs> but but it's so I but like Tuesday is it Tuesday? I don't know. But we're we're both self employed or contract driven or whatever we're gig people and so that requires you to be your own business manager in a sense unless you can afford a business manager which we obviously cannot and we're we're terrible at it yes yeah exactly now when we show up and someone says rehearse we can rehearse or when we had a theater company our driving force was always we would when we were creating shows uh, uh we would book the show we right. know we're going to be playing for these weeks here, and we would 
title the show and start advertising the show. And then we would start building the show. Because we knew we had to have it. We were painted into a corner and we must. And that was, that got everything done. Yeah. Now that's not happening. (laughs) (laughs) Something very similar with this podcast. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do this podcast. And then my production associate said, right, this is your first booking. And it's like, Uh, yeah. (gasps) I have all these things to do. And then I had an absolute yeah. Nelly theatrical stage panic attack. I went, oh, my God, I now need to yeah. do this. I think you've got to give yourself a deadline. Otherwise, you know, it could take a, yeah. a month or some yeah. days. We're, well, we talked about it. We're, we're about to embark on a two-person all-audio 12th night. Oh, wow. Wow. Because we want to. I'm like, like we're we're going to we're going to make it available to other humans, but mostly we kind of want to, you know, fooling with the pitches of our voices slightly while also doing proper voices. But fortunately, Twelfth Night is coming soon. And we've told people. And we've about told it. people. Well, we've told people about <laughs> it out loud, but you could still wriggle your way out of that. Oh, technical difficulties. But Twelfth Night is actually approaching. So we've given ourselves a like, look. The first edition of this has to be available to people by the 6th of January. Yes, absolutely. The Twelfth Night. I've got two favorite Shakespeare plays. Mm. This is one of them. Um, who's playing first day? Greg. I am. Okay. All right. Because of the ukulele. Ah, uh, yes. Come away, dear. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Come Away Death, if I remember right, Come Away Death is really Irish. Yes. Like the song itself feels like a, a, a really sort of aggressively depressing and maudlin in a way that seems like if Festy is going to sing it, there are those who take him to have his own darknesses. But I also would like to just be like, well, he knows who he's entertaining. So Orsino probably would like to hear a, a dark Irish, she's yep. dying of consumption, and during <laughs> Young Charms kind of a, a song. <laughs> yeah. So, so why not? I want something a little bit more light entertainment while she's kind of swooning. Yeah, right. right. Who's yeah. paying? I'm actually really looking forward to this production now of Twelfth Night. So it's on the podcast, and yeah. I now know about it. And as soon as I <laughs> broadcast this podcast, the rest of the world's going to know about it. So, uh, <laughs> quick snap. It's not like we have to memorize anything. No one's looking. Right. <laughs> we don't need costumes. We can have the scripts right there. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hers or Toby. Yeah. Well. And you're going to pump up my bass a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yes, yes. Colonel Blimp you a little bit. I'm going to play Sir Toby, yeah. You're playing Sir Toby? Yeah. <gasps> oh, amazing. And who's playing yeah. Sir Andrew? Greg. Uh, I am, yeah. That's and right. he's also playing Olivia. <gasps> yeah, I've always wanted yes! that. Yes! Yes! Sir Toby and Andrew are just, you know, they are such ridiculous, pompous characters. Right. Yeah. I look forward. There's a lot of comic humor in both of them. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a lot of cruelty in both of them, but there is a lot of cruelty. Oh, a lot. Yeah. And if this one goes well, we might do another one. Who, Who knows? knows? Right. Or if we enjoy it, I should say, we might do another one. I don't think – we're fortunately at the point where we have nothing to lose but the time we've put into it. It's right. not as if someone's going to say, you know, we really weren't happy with the product that you gave us. We don't, we don't really care. We would like people <laughs> to like it. Whether they like it or dislike it is not going to stop us or start us from doing a second one. So that, <laughs> right. Is that accurate? Fantastic. So just in the space of five minutes, this is how good a producer I am not. Uh, I've just got you to confess that you are doing Twelfth Night. It will be on air by the 6th of January, all the cast that you're playing, and you're doing a second production. So um, stay tuned. All right, great. See, that's what we need. We need someone to boss us around, essentially. Thank you. A little bit of company management 101. Right, chaps? Oh, yeah. Let's go. Pressure. So as everything has changed, and this is not the world that we knew in – February or January of 2020, and everything's become a little bit topsy turvy. What have you realized that you've both become grateful for? Greg? Abigail, yeah, yeah. I think the fact that we are here, that we are here in this house together. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching a lot of friends and family yeah. just struggling with being where they are with each other. And I, I feel like you and I have been together here very happy uh and and when the emotional upheavals have happened it has been about the outside world not about us being here yeah no no no. Uh, this was a rough year for us anyway my my older sister died in january oh i'm so sorry to hear that uh so so we were already in the midst of grieving and strangeness when everything started to go downhill it seems like everyone just caught up with us. Yeah. And so, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's been such a strange year anyway. Yep. That being together in our in our little house where we feel kind of safe has, has been 
kind of lovely. And I feel, I feel a little guilty saying that, frankly, <laughs> because I know so many people who've been struggling so much. No, I understand that. Friends and family and uh, togetherness yeah. becomes really, really, really important. Yeah. Okay, so this question could be super, super embarrassing for you both. Um, I'm really hoping that it is, but I have a feeling it will be very entertaining for us. So that's, that's why I'm going to ask it. But what is something that you don't want the rest of the world to know that you've geeked out at during lockdown? And examples of these are binge watching television shows or playing computer games for 17 hours or staring at walls for 52 hours or maybe eating a packet of chocolate biscuits in under three minutes. Just, you know, as an example. <laughs> Although in fairness, I, I, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm more of like a plain O.D. hobnob, not chocolate. Mm, yeah. There's a Girl Scout cookie that they sell in the States called a Dosey Dough. Yep. Yeah. Mm. And they are essentially a plain original hobnob with peanut butter spread and made into a sandwich cookie, which means that if you put peanut butter between a pair of hobnobs, you have made like a wagon wheel sized do si dough. <laughs> but the one I initially thought of was my discovery of Chinese period drama, Chinese television. I can watch these sweeping sagas of emperors and concubines but and they're still whatnot. Terrible just soap they, operas right, with magnificent costume but yeah, right. Yeah. They're like novellas but but in Chinese. Yeah. And uh, I I have a deep love for them, and especially at the beginning uh, when we were really seriously yeah. in lockdown in those first few months, I watched a lot, a lot wow. of those. And because uh, Greg, Mister, oh yes, I'm better at reading, and I my focus is all on reading a hundred books or whatever it is. I'm uh, I haven't been able to focus on that. I was like, where are the pretty people in the pretty silk robes doing some wire flying and fighting and stuff and Show you me say, that. You say that like we didn't start this lockdown by watching the most recent season of Altamar together Altamar. on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, okay. A particular favorite of ours, which I guess I'll put mine in is that. Uh, the, the is Spanish, the Spanish, on the Spanish like early 20th century uh, period novellas. Again, it's, it's, it's what you watch any uh, soap for, for implausible stuff done by beautiful people, right? I yeah. mean, that's the. The implausible people of, of high seas, which is a, 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 an ocean liner going from, oh yeah, first mate cheekbone. Uh, a, a, an implausible story of an ocean liner going from Barcelona to Brazil just after World War II. There's there's murder. Of course, there's a murder. You got to have a murder. There's Absolutely. murder. There's there's Nazi. There's Nazi gold. Nazi, not just Nazis, but Nazi gold. Somebody goes blind. Somebody goes blind. There's a pregnancy thing that happens, and I'd like to remind you that this is a two-week voyage. Um, so somehow there may or may not be some supernatural elements. I'm not entirely sure. Horrible assaults, uh, another murder. Uh, all, all done by very beautiful Spanish. Right, right. Yes. The old people are beautiful. Yeah. The, the, the sort of unseemly supposed... That, the people who you're actively told are ugly are like, oh, they've put disfiguring makeup on a beautiful person to make his his wounds or whatever. It's uh, it's just it's nonsense, and I love every second yeah. of it. And I'm not disdainful toward that that sort of thing normally. It's just not the thing that I watch. Right. It's like the people embracing the Hallmark Christmas Christmas movies yes, right now. Sure. They're silly. They're silly fluff, and it's like. We all need silly fluff right now. Absolutely. I actually want to move on to the next question because this is the most okay. perfect, perfect segue because you've just been talking about soap operas and ridiculousness because this question actually has two parts. I feel like a, you know, a school teacher. Right, children? This question has two parts. Part one. If a train hits a soap opera actor. <laughs> so Rani Gazoo, with their latest song, has trended number one on Spotify. Therefore, a soap opera has contacted you both and offered you lead acting roles. What type of characters are you hoping that they're going to write for you, considering soaps are just a little bit more dramatic than real life? Yeah. I mean, I always like playing the villain. Yeah, me too. That they're, was what my immediate thought. They're just 
juicy yeah. and trying to figure out how to make yourself love them and want them to win because that's the way you get well, into them. Yeah, yeah, right. Or you want them to keep, yeah, 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 yeah. What, playing evil is but, so much fun. But villain is vague because there's a, there's a, there's a pretty wide palette on yes. soaps. I know that I would like one of those, the, the suave villain. Like mm. there, there are the ones that are seedy and awful, but then there are the ones inevitably with the mustache and the ascot. The, yeah, what's yeah. his name? Um, I don't know how familiar this is internationally, but on the Young and the Restless in our era, in the 1980s, there was uh, yeah. a guy named Victor. Oh. What was his name? Uh-huh. Victor and Nikki, right? Victor and with the Nikki, two of them, yeah. and she, I think, is like she must be 85 years old right now. And I saw her on something the other a couple of weeks ago, and she looks spent essentially. Right. So to see, he's great. He's great. Now, you know, I don't understand what that property is because it doesn't look like work done. It's bizarre. What, but, but could they write something us to, for us to do together? Like, um, well, hang on, no, like no, 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 you, can't, you can't go there because that's part two of the question. Oh, okay. so, so don't go there yet. Okay, okay. Well, like, a hyphenated last name. I think I'd like a hyphenated last name. I think that would secure the villainy. Do you know what the, the way that you're saying is? It sounds like Alan Rickman in Die Hard. That kind of villain. Oh, uh, th- uh, yes. But uh, I would prefer it to be of a soap opera level, less of a blowing up the skyscraper and more of a just making other people's lives difficult and fooling with their inheritances and <laughs> that sort of thing. I feel I, I don't want to be a supervillain or a terrorist, more of a more of a, a con a, man, a, 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 a con man yeah. slash mm-hmm. someone with more Dickensian concerns. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would, I would, I'd be happier as a as a Murdstone or a Heap than yep. than as a uh, whatever Alan Rickman's name was in that. I forget. It's Christmas. He was yeah. thinking I'd remember. And but I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, con man too, or con woman. I, I will say I've loved the con mans all my life. I've always been drawn to the character that I've never actually wanted to do that to people. And the last. How shall I say? The last four years in the United States have really soured that for me. <laughs> My love of of Harold Hill and the Music Man and of Melville Confidence Man and all of the glorious Confidence Men of popular culture that I've always thought were such fun to play. I am now a little. Oh, it's this. Yeah. Yeah. The exploration is less joyful than what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I've just decided what I would want to be, oh, though. Oh, okay. Yes. I would like to be a black widow. Many, <gasps> many husbands that I have oh, killed. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Life imitates art. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I see your acting skill. Yeah. That's right. Someone so different from you. <laughs> You're still alive. <laughs> just. But not for long. <laughs> Well, actually, it's funny that you've just said that because that is going to segue perfectly into part two of this question. (laughs) So one of my embarrassing guilty pleasures during lockdown or during the past couple of months is I've been catching up on a UK soap called Emmerdale. I always watch it when I'm in the UK. It's set up in Yorkshire. Okay. And again, you know, ridiculousness because, you know, getting (laughs) up, having a cup of tea, going to bed is very, very boring drama. There is actually a real life husband and wife on the show, but they kind of can't stand each other (laughs) as characters. So, are you hoping that you may be possible enemies in the show? Yeah. 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 I don't think that would keep us from being married on the show. (laughs) I think that's part of the delight is if you're a black widow who has been unsuccessful with this most recent one who continually eludes you living right <laughs> because there is some i'm sure there's some financial reason and then it becomes the sport of right of uh, uh thwarting each other right. at some point right right and then you get that whole any of my enemy of my enemy is my friend business that interact that, that affects our interactions sure. with the other characters where they have to ally themselves with you or with me because yes. they want to you know, I will I will thwart your villainy by doing inadvertent good for someone else, mm-hmm. even though then I will mm-hmm. probably swipe it from under. We actually seem to be describing less a soap opera than the the BBC radio series uh, uh, Bleak Expectations. It occurs to me <laughs> it's actually that's where our characters would end up. Um, if any radio or television producers are listening to this podcast and need some story writers, please contact us in the links below. We want fanciful characters. We've got them coming in spades. Right. 
We'll play all of them. We, we can play all of them. <laughs> or I should say. <laughs> Do you know what? So I'm just having a creative moment. I'm go, you as the Black Widow, I think you should wear only yeah. white. Oh, oh, I like it. Yeah. And maybe a hat with a veil every once in a while. <laughs> yes, like a top hat with a, like a Victorian veil. Oh, oh yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes. The woman. Because we would definitely have to set this in a period. It couldn't be. Modern. Well, it's more fun. While we're making something up, we might as well enjoy it. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's exactly right. Exactly right. So seriously, if any radio or television producers are listening, <laughs> please contact us. We can come up with a whole script synopsis. Um, well, in about five yeah. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think so. We have yeah. some old Forester downstairs. I believe that would probably <laughs> lubricate the creative wheels. Very easily. Well, Abigail and Gregory, sadly, that is the end of the questions. Uh, but, uh. but, just before we <laughs> conclude the interview. Dame Judy Dench and Sir Ian McKellen ring you after remembering your performance at the BBC Shakespeare Festival in Stratford upon Avon. Oh my God. After COVID, they want you to put on a Shakespeare play and they both want you to be part of it. Which play is it and who are you both playing? And also, who would you like in your cast? Oh, goodness. Do you want. Wait, wait. Hmm. I, mean, I know one of two things that she's going to say, so I'll let you say. I, I, I would love to play Beatrice and Benedict again. Yes, that would be the life. They, yes. I feel like we could have, I could have done the, that production we were in for years and never gotten bored with it. I There's agree. always more to mine. Uh, or Twelfth Night, because it's my favorite. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And even though this is up to the director to choose this, do you think you could possibly advocate a, a positive time period to get some Rani Gazoo songs in the show? <laughs> oh, easily. Well, actually, sadly, uh, uh, I think the RSC just did it set, what, five or six years ago, uh, set. In 1920s. Uh, right. Set like just, they did Love's Neighbors Lost and they did uh, they did before World War I and, and then after World War I, I guess, the gimmick. My lovely friend, Mr. Christopher Luscombe, directed both those productions. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I love those productions. I love both of them. But there's no reason why you couldn't. Twelfth Night would work, too. Oh, Twelfth Night would work. Definitely. Uh, terrifically uh, if, there. If but, perhaps her brother had died in, if you're setting it, First World War. Yeah, oh, oh, right. Brother, yeah, Olivia's brother, yeah. could yeah, come point. out of that. Uh, would we be playing Olivia and Viola in that version instead of Beatrice and Benedict? Is that, uh, <laughs> that would be the most fun. Well, which one of yeah. you is going to play Olivia in this production? Uh, you know, the Judy Dench and McKellen production? I would think that the, uh, could go either way. Okay. Could we... Do it, Can we do one of those night? one of those True West situations? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One night you play Olivia and I we, play Viola, and then we switch the next night. We tried to convince the directors of the production of Shrew that we did uh, uh, a couple of years before uh, uh, to uh, to allow us to alternate, and somehow it just. I think it was more of a costume budget issue, really. Right. We certainly couldn't share the same costume. We could not. No. <laughs> for Kate and True Gale. No. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely not. But that would give them true meaning to repertory theatre. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You that... get people come back twice, if only out of curiosity or a mean spirited competitiveness. Yeah. <laughs> if you'd like to follow Abigail and Gregory on social media, Abigail is on Twitter at Broccolizer Baby. <laughs> yeah, <Yes. laughs> Broccoli's And Gregory is G J Morpen or Mopen, depending where you come from. And they are both on Instagram at We Are Rani Gazoo. Yes. You can also support Rani Gazoo on Patreon for music and spoken word listening delights. www.patreon.com forward slash Rani Gazoo. All links will be listed in the show's description for your convenience. So because we're talking about Rani Gazoo, what have you guys got coming up that everyone can tune into? Well, we're going to do, uh, we're not entirely sure what on what date, but if you are following us on one of those social media outlets, you will find out that we're going to do another live stream of a few songs at some point, uh, possibly in the, like the week between Christmas and New Year's yeah. we were talking about. Okay, okay. And uh also, uh, we've got several things that I think are going to be released to the Patreon uh, 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 subscribers, but uh, a couple of those I suspect we'll put out to uh, the general world as well. We've been talking about doing a, uh, we've been doing some friendly commentary tracks for uh, 
that you can link up with video uh, of uh, different things are available on YouTube in different countries, of course, but uh, yeah. some gloriously terrible 1970s uh, variety specials <laughs> and uh, and that sort of thing. We've been we just sort of watch them and have a and I make one of the aforementioned cocktails and and we enjoy and we don't have desperately interesting factual trivial things to say. I mean, we have trivial things to say. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're just not maybe factual, but yeah. uh, we. It's, Think of it as watching something ridiculous with a couple of friends. Yes, yeah, so that just don't let you talk. That's fantastic. Abigail and Gregory, I'm seriously a big fan. It was a great honour to meet you both at the opening night of Romeo and Juliet at Kentucky Shakespeare, uh, especially oh. after I saw you open the BBC Shakespeare 400th <laughs> anniversary special. No, no, no. I, I thought it was really surreal because I had some friends at the RSC. They said, watch this production. I started watching it and I remember it opened. Uh, Gregory... Were you all in black with a white collar? I yeah. was. I was sort of the, because of my male hair pattern and <laughs> beard. and my beard, they put me, actually it was a costume I'd worn for Malvolio, something the year previous, but it more or less skewed me Shakespeare, though I think I was also holding a, a faux lute yeah, ukulele. Yeah, I Because I remember opening it up and they said, oh, this is from Kentucky. And I'm going, I've just opened to Stratford and I'm seeing something from Kentucky. And it took me a second to go. <laughs> What's going on? And then, you know, when I was in Louisville and I was talking to some friends and they said, oh, yes, we know these people. And then I got to meet you and you were these people. I just went, oh, my God. Really, really small world. My memory of that morning is that we were at New Place, which had not yet been opened or landscaped. So it was very muddy. And also that we all, when we saw that they had opened it to let Prince Charles walk around later in the day, we were very like, oh, well, anyway, after we did our thing, they sort of opened it and just let anyone. <laughs> just anybody, <laughs> any old prince. Any old prince. <laughs> now that we've been there. I also remember being glad that we didn't know how many people were watching no, we, no. before we did it. Yes, of oh, course. Nerve wracking. What amuses me is that the other person we know that we made an impression on from being there is that we were in part of the procession, the funeral thing that they did for Shakespeare. Yeah, the next Trinity, morning the next going morning. to the church. And we were marching very solemnly along with everyone else. And uh, I mean, as solemnly as you can in cross-guarded yellow socks. <laughs> there was a nice lady in a puffy jacket with a camera, a phone in front of her face, standing off sides along the road there. Matt Wallace, the artistic director of Peggy Shakespeare, who was standing just over my left shoulder, said through one side of his mouth, that's Helen Mirren. <laughs> uh, don't look. So don't, don't look, which of course look. we all sort of... <laughs> Very hurt our neck not looking, you know. Uh, so we also know that somewhere on a camera roll, in a camera roll folder of Helen Mirren's phone, <laughs> is, us. is us. Wow. Which I find utterly fascinating and, well, it helps one get to sleep at night, really, you know. <laughs> to finish the final episode of the Lockdown Hotline Sessions, a special surprise, Abigail and Gregory as Rani Gazoo have decided to play us out. Chaps, would you like to vamp on your opening chord as we're about to start the outro? Of course. As we come to the end of the final episode of the Lockdown Hotline Sessions, my name is Danielle Lonnan and you can find me on all the socials at Dame Diva Dan. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of this series. A very special thanks to everyone involved, especially Alice and Jenny and our production associate, Claire Miller. Stay safe and be kind. Season's greetings. Listen to me, honey, dear. Something's wrong with you, I feel. It's getting harder to believe you. Harder and harder each year. I don't want to make you blue, but you need a talking to. Like a lot of people I know, here's what's wrong with you. Can I join in? After you get what you want, you don't want it.
This episode of the Lockdown Hotline Sessions was recorded and produced in Sydney in December of 2020.